This is February 9th, 1984. This it is. is Joe Todd, an interview with Mr. William Beck. Yeah. Mr. Beck, where were you born? I was born in Garfield County. Uh, my father made a race to the Cherokee Strip uh -huh. uh, in 93. Here, equated, of course, with that, the Cherokee yeah. Strip. Right. When's your birthday? January the 3rd. I was born in 97. And who was your father? Stephen Arthur Beck. And who was your mother? Nora Ann Lawson Beck. Mm -hmm. Where were they from? Well, I've been coming to Oklahoma. They were, they were living in Rich Hill, Missouri. And my dad was working in uh, some coal mines there. And uh, they had started a family. They had a couple of children. And uh, I guess they'd read of the old Oklahoma race. And so this new one's announced, and they decided that uh, it would be a better place to raise a family in Oklahoma on a farm than in the coal mine area. So did you made the race. Did, did your father talk about making the race? Quite a little. What did he say about it? Oh, he, had a, he rode a horse. Uh, of course, the the kept later kept. He, uh, of course, he rode quite a ways before he began to find where he'd gotten away from some other people. And uh, he finally arrived at the quarter where he there. And uh, I don't know what, I didn't really understand the markings. But uh, their deal was that they would have a, of course, a stake with their name on it, that they would drive in the ground, something to indicate to somebody else, my name is already here. Mm -hmm. He drove his stake, but he wasn't, uh, before he, I think he even got on his horse, he saw another fellow. Well, of course, he had to deal with this problems of contests and so forth. and. Uh, they visited a while, and he'd driven his stake somewhere else, but on the same corner. Dad says, I'll give you five dollars to go pick, for if you go pick up your stake. He thought, well, well, give me the five. So with that gave him the five dollars, he went pick his stake up. And uh, then he claimed the, yep. made the claim. Where was it? Where was his claim? That's in the northeastern part of Gar Garfield County, uh, five miles east of Hunter. And uh, it was there on the side house that I was born in. Two years later, later. How uh, long did you live in the side house? Oh, they lived. They did. They built their house. Uh, they, they they dug in the side of a little hill, you know. And uh, I I think uh, they they dug down three feet maybe, and then a little side of about four or more. And then down here they didn't have steps. They can walk out on the ground, you know. So they did it. Yeah. Uh, and they built the house. Uh, my first recollection was in the house. I can't remember the side house. Yeah. Later they turned it into a cellar. You know, it was used. But uh, we were not living in it. My earliest recollection was this house, which was probably built about, uh, let's see, they moved there and built a side house in about 94. Uh, born in 97, uh, I'm sure they, they built her frame house before 1900. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what kind of chores do you do in the farm? Oh, let me, my, my uh, parents, uh, well, they, they uh, tried to do pretty much this thing of uh, self-sufficiency. So so they had uh, some milk cows, and then the herd got into, oh, never a big deal, six or eight cows, sold cream in town, and uh, uh, always had a few hogs, uh, chickens. I remember, I remember very much as a boy, when the chicken time come, they'd get big enough to fry. But they send me out to 
to catch a chicken, you know, to, I'd run one down somewhere else, get in the corner, catch a big one, big rooster, and she'd get it for her. Cook a meal. I, that's when I was a boy. Chickens, and I started milking pretty early. Um, and the schoolhouse where I went to school was a mile and a half from where our, our house. What was the name of the school? Enterprise, a little enterprise school. <clears throat> uh, Who was your first teacher? Probably name was Snavely. Snavely. He was also a little bit of a preacher. I had uh, quite a few women teachers later, but uh, I had my name was Slave, Snavely. Mm -hmm. uh, was a teacher. I, I'm not, I, you know, I was just thinking, well, I was sitting today thinking about there. I'm pretty sure that I remember the initiation of rural free delivery. Uh, Somebody ought to check that. I might, my memory could be wrong, but it seemed to me like I remember him talking. Well, of course, we lived five miles from Hunter. I suppose we went to Hunter once a week with some milk, cream, eggs, get your mail. And talking about it, hearing talk, when they're going to go to delivering the mail. Uh, and uh, our box then was, we were, the house was on a half a mile line, and the box was up here uh, half a mile away. And I can remember a boy a lot of times, uh, work, you work in a field all day or something, and time of supper, well, well nobody we ought to go get the mail. So I was, of course, the boy that ran up that half a mile, dark, you know, and get scared, and I'd run all the way. Get the mail out of the box and run home. Mm -hmm. That's when I was ten years old. See? Mm -hmm. I can remember that pretty well. One of the one of the one of the early stories that told to me about even a little ahead of my time. I was reminded of it at this woman's article in the last historical magazine, who tried to claim over here. Perry, uh, did you read there? Mm -mm. You didn't read the story. No. Historical. Last month's historical. Oklahoma historical news, you know. Well, uh, you see, he ran, he made the claim in the fall of 93. He goes to the land office and puts his name in it and makes a claim. Goes back to Missouri, horseback, of course. And they load their family up in a freight car to come to Cremont, 15 miles away, on the Rock Island. The Rock Island from Eden to Wichita on that road. That was already open. And they skipped uh, there, and uh, some uh, a milk cow and a couple of horses and some tools and household goods and utensils and what have you. Um, and uh, made it across. Well, it didn't get much crop, of course, in '94. Mm -hmm. Time they got there in the spring, broke a little sod, made a little, some made some garden. I suppose planted some corn. wasn't much of a year. They didn't have much. Fall came, and oh, that's the question: How are you going to live through the winter? Yeah. Where are you going to buy? Where are you going to buy the groceries in the winter? It was a difficult one, and I've heard him. I've heard him tell this that somewhere or other he managed for two dollars, and he went and got on the freight and rode back to Mitchell, Missouri, bumped on the freights, chains off, and got there, and went back to work in the mines. And first checking it, of course, he sends to my mother. She takes a wagon and she fixes a covered wagon the team and loads them up to drive a wagon from there, clear back to Missouri to spend the winter. Quite a right, that's quite a trip. Now some of the uh, the older two boys, they were one of them, they were five, about five and six. And they can remember that. Yeah. They can remember that. I wasn't I wasn't even born yet when that was I've heard them tell a lot about that one. 
that's quite a quite a trip. Mm -hmm. That covered wagon trip. Well, they spent the winter and come back. That was the last time they had to had to because uh, they didn't dig all the farm. Mm -hmm. How long did you go to school? Well, under schooling is interesting. A little bit, I think. Have you ever heard of George Rainey? George Rainey? George Rainey. R-A-I-N-E-Y. If you read a historical, he, he was the county superintendent of the schools of uh, Garfield County. And he was very, very uh, anxious for rural schools to consolidate so they could go to high school, make high schools. Well, the year that I finished eighth grade, which would be, of course, about uh, 1911, uh, he came out and organized this uh, township for one-room schools into a district, and they voted to consolidate. He promoted it. And my father was elected on the new board, a region of a school board. Well, they put up then to bonds for a building. Well, the people who were anti really got out and beat around and beat the bonds. You had to have two thirds, you know. Mm -hmm. So they beat the bonds and they didn't build a house. <coughs> <clears throat> well, you had problems then, and uh, that was those two years. Uh, finally, these people decided that we'd have a school anyway, and went together and they built a frame out of their contributions, kind of a building with about three rooms. Hired a few people, two or three. I remember hired a guy that was supposed to teach a little Latin. Uh, and I went to school there, and they moved these bunches from these schools into this new thing, of course. They had beds on the board, or they moved all their desks. Well, they hired the wrong lawyer. The other guys were Milton Garber. Have you ever heard of the Garber people? In yeah. the well, Milt Garber was the Gene Stipe of that day. The other people hired Milt Garber, so you can tell, you can figure out what happened. Uh, after two years, they busted it up, and I remember going to, uh, of course, my dad. But this time, it had recognized well that they've got us, they've got us licked. But we'd try to go to school over there, and uh, after things, all well, my people went to church and Sunday school. They'd organized. Sunday school over there, church service in this building. Well, they, they, the order came out from the judge for, for uh, dissolve the district and for all these benches to go back to their schoolhouses. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the people on our side, uh, uh, maybe that's a rumor. Maybe they had that, maybe they didn't. Well, as I say, my dad decided he was licked. But I decided, now you see, I'm now a little older. I rode a horse over there, and my buddy and I, George Orville and I, we went down to the schoolhouse. Well, the people who were for the consolidation wanted to hold it, they had their guns, shotguns, pistols, whatever you. And uh, they'll not take this stuff unless they got order. Well, along about uh, after dark, a well, while, uh, here come an automobile and about a half a dozen uh, wagons, teams, to all these things. They're going to get that night. They're going to, mm -hmm. going to wait till tomorrow. They're going to take them back tonight. Mm -hmm. Well, I remember Mr. Burrell, who was the group that I was with. Of course, I didn't have a gun. I was just a kid. A kid. George and I didn't. And uh, so, uh, uh, we were there though, and uh, like Mr. World as chairman, boss, 
He said, but fellas, of course, he says, if they got an order, if that's a legal order, there's nothing we can do. We, we can't do it. If they just don't come out here to, to get this stuff, well, we'll just stand our ground. We'll tell them we're not going to let them have it. So don't do anything. So we put all the lights out inside. Here, this thing blew up in the car. And all the sheriff called out. Well, called him on, on there, and he says, uh, I'll come out there and visit with you. The sheriff said, well, we don't want any trouble. He knew that there was guns in the deal. Mm -hmm. Things could go to get rough. So Frank went out, and on the front of his light, sheriff got his paper out and read the order from beginning to end. And there's a seal, and there's the judge's seal, there's all this sort of yeah. stuff. So it was all over. So Frank called to these people to uh, said they've got the order, so we'll leave. We'll just leave quietly. And they walked out and, and walked on home. Well, uh, George and I, I guess I suppose I did. Of course, as my people were pretty much Sunday school people. Mm -hmm. And somebody had bought a piano and some songbooks. Who was Sunday school material? Mm -hmm. So I just said, well, this Sunday school material don't need to go back to the school districts. So I walked to the sheriff. I told him, I said, this piano here belongs to the Sunday school and these songbooks. What about us staying here and talking like that? He said, that's a good idea. He says, you boys go around to all these rooms and you get all the, you get all the songbooks that belong to Sunday school. <clears throat> and you go to put them on top of the piano. And we just leave this piano and these songbooks here. And these other fellows were already unscrewing these things. Of course, they didn't take us very long. They were working. So George and I walked out. But somebody had bought one of these bells, you know, that you put in the next school. It was out there in the yard. And these are all, you know. George and I decided, well, that is dead. That if we run that on these horses, that is getting, that is it's teeth these people something. Mm -hmm. So we ran his bell. The horses started running, whoa, 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 you know, and they're grabbing the horses. And we scared, we missed, we got away. Of course, kids, you do it once, you can do it again. Mm -hmm. Next time we come back, of course, somebody was right there and grabbed us. I can remember the sheriff got us in there the line. He, he gets his handcuffs out. So he said, now this is what I ought to do to you boys. Put these handcuffs on. You can take it either. And lock you up. And tomorrow morning call your folks to come and get you. But he said, I'm going to think about it. He says, well, which way do you live from here? East or west? Well, we lived west. He says, oh, there's the road, west. You want to get out on that road and don't even look back. It'll let you go. <laughs> oh, well, that's, it was quite a, you know, as a boy, it was quite an experience, you know, this uh, schooling, we're talking about schooling. So I had to go then, because I never had a high school, so I went to OSU. Some freshman, they, they, they had, still had fresh, some freshmen. So that fall, I went to OSU. What year was that? I went in 13. 1913. We tried to put this up in 1911, and in the fall of 1913, I uh, went to, uh, to Oklahoma State, well, then all this, a and College, and enrolled as a sub-freshman. Well, of course, then, uh, then I was there, working on. I was a junior in college in the swing of 17, when the uh, when the uh, war was declared. And, uh, this, oh, it just happens. I, I was a little, I was inclined to get oratorical and that sort of thing. And uh, we had contests. <coughs> and in Oklahoma, they had an intercollegiate speech contest for peace. Well, the state contest on how to have a whole peace in the world was held at Stillwater 
on April the 6th, 1917. Well after, but we knew what was going on. But what was just about to happen. So after this contest, people tell them about peace. The order, order, win, and peace. I didn't represent the college on that one. I had on some of them. A good buddy of mine would represent Oklahoma. Oh, 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 oh. After the contest is over, of course, we, we're interested in knowing what's going to happen. So to find out, because then all oh, the only communication was telegraph, and the telegraph would come to the little newspaper downtown. That's the only place you'd get the information. <coughs> so a bunch of us went to town after this contest on peace. And uh, the state had, the United States had declared war on Germany that day. Mm -hmm. At OSU, did you live on campus or off campus? I lived off campus. Did I you? Lived, never stay on campus. I batched. Of course, we, uh, you, you know, when you batch, you, we, there was four of us rented a house down on Hester Street. Of course, no inside I had a crapper out of the alley, you know. And there was water tap in front where you got your water. That was a total. Well, we rented the whole house for $5 a month. Four of us who lived in there, we batched, cooked, we ate what we could get. Um, What'd you study it? Still work? What'd you study? I, I was agriculture and I don't husbandry. Mm -hmm. I, I said I don't husbandry. And uh, who was the head of the that department? Well, I mean, the fellow, there was a fellow there, but, but while but while I was gone to war, Bill Blizzard came in. Now then, the man ahead of it was named. Uh, he liked those. Or when I was when I enrolled in that that department. But but uh, something happened during the war. I was gone two years, and came back and finished. And my senior year after the war, when and you know uh, you've heard of Dr. Blizzard, mm -hmm. who was a uh, quite a quite a agricultural livestock man. He was head when I came back, and he was my teacher when I graduated in Hanover in 1920. I came back after the war. Uh, the uh, Oh, I, I, of course, as I say, we had military training there in those days. Still do, I guess. Of course, we had to then. It was required then. Yeah. Um, what building did you have your classes in? What building did you have your classes in? Well, we had Moral Hall was there. Moral Hall burned one summer while I was in school, and they rebuilt it. Uh, Gardner Hall. Burned while I was there one in the school year. And the old library, the old library, it was a chemistry building, Moral Hall, the, the uh, gymnasium was a little low building over there west. I suppose the floor, basketball floor, was. Uh, Less than regulation, and I could see 200 people if they were all got there, everybody fall. Uh, that was before the big building was built. Um, what about Williams and Old Central? Old Central, of course, was there. Williams and Old Central, Chemistry, Moral Hall. I guess you call it, we guys we call that Gardner all that. We women's dormitory then. Mm -hmm. uh, did you have classes in Old Central? Oh yes. Yeah, what I was the that. What was the inside of Old Central like? Can you describe? Oh, it just thing? just just the uh, building you you had. If I remember right, there were four. I'm not sure if there was four classrooms. On the first floor, I think there, if I remember now, my memory has been a long time. It seemed to me like there was. There was a basement or something down there. I don't remember a classroom down there, but it had maybe a heating system or something. And if I remember right, there's four classrooms and the stairway. And then on the next floor, here was a, 
a pretty good size room, which was the only auditorium they had at that time, uh, for an assembly. And one room up there, maybe a professor's room or something, offered to do. It's the kind of way I remember it. Uh, the classrooms were 25 foot square, I'd say, for them. How was the auditorium furnished? Right now, I can't recall. What about the light fixtures? I, I, I remember it was... I, I don't remember the furniture. But we had there, I had assemblies there. Some of the meetings were there. And there was a chemistry building. There was... Uh, the old, I guess, we called it the old library. Mm -hmm. There, it's been redone. Yeah. I don't know, it's not the same building. Right. It wasn't torn down, but it was redone and added to. Have you been to Stillwater recently? Oh, uh, the last time I was there was in a year, a year ago. Uh, did you go to Old Central? Oh, uh, just not, I didn't go inside. It's a museum now. Yeah, but they said it's here. It's been restored. You've been in it? Yeah. I'd like you to go look at it, see what you think of it. Well, I ought to do that for the next time I'm up there. Who was president of A&M while you were going there? Well, I went, uh, when I first went, a man by the name of Connell. See, yeah, maybe that's his name, Connell. See, Connell. And then, uh, when I came back and graduated, Cantrell, J.W. Cantrell mm -hmm. was the president. He was president in 1920 when I graduated. Yes. Did you ever know uh, Angelo Scott? Angelo Scott. He was first president of A&M. No, I didn't. I wasn't that far back. Mm -hmm. um, did you join the Army or were you drafted? Joined. Of course, I told you about that. It was this December, the, April the 6th, the next day, the next day, we went to see our commanding officer, lieutenant, first lieutenant, running the thing there. Of course, he, they had this, I don't know whether, uh, about the name of General Leonard Wood and, and uh, Theodore Roosevelt who had uh, recognized problems coming up. And the summer before, they organized a kind of a volunteer. Oh, what it amounted to officer training camp. I don't know whether they got some finance in there, but they praised the money themselves, but they promoted this sort of thing. Well, when we went to see our lieutenant, the next day, he said this. He already knew about this, these training camps this summer. He says, that's what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. He says, the only way they can do this is, is to uh, have an officer's training program. And they'll, they'll do that before we, before we know it. Well, we all signed up. Or well, quite much of us did. A dozen of us, I knew. Juniors and seniors, uh, and of course in the papers the next day, of course you know, was, they were passing the moment there, and uh, Fort Longinet Roots at Little Rock, which was an old fort, Longinet Roots was a general of a Civil War days, you know, more or less, and they had named the fort after him, and they went out for building a, they building a, these camp things, barracks, you know, mm -hmm. they got the crews out there and build a, build a barracks the day and build another tomorrow, build another the next day, you know, get people into it. And uh, now the war was declared in April, and we were ordered to report then in May, May the 5th. We went to, uh, we went to Little Rock, mm -hmm. to the first the first officers training camp to call them. Of course, now then they all, they numbered them for about first five or six, and then they'd say, "Well, that's not the way." To, they quit numbering them anymore. 
Chris Thompson's training camp. You know, and they had a second, third, and fourth for fair. I, I, I went on the first one. Yeah. What? How was officers training in Little Rock? Just describe it. Well, we 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 they had this barracks, of course, the barracks, and we had a, a colonel, I mean, a lieutenant, an army man who had graduated from West Point, by the name of Floyd, kind of a hard-boiled guy, and he was the commanding officer of this company. Well, and he got the rest of it. And I, I, I uh, was uh, for a while until they got some more people. Was a mess sergeant or something, you know? You did that. You, you, they had cots and uh, and, uh, and you uh, score the infantry drill. It was an infantry outfit. Where are we? Mm -hmm. Infantry, infantry drill. Got whip, got rifles, and we started. Can you describe? What your average day was like? What time you'd get up? Oh, it was pretty early. The guy blew the well there and get up, you know, in the morning. And we was up and. Uh, when was Reveille? What time? I'd guess it was about uh, 5.30. Could have been 6 o'clock. But pretty early. And you'd, uh, then you'd had, you had, you had the police up. You're supposed to get your bunk cleaned up, your bed made, and your stuff put together. But the time. Uh, the whistle for the for the uh, for the uh, breakfast, and mm -hmm. of course they they had a, they had a uh, another one where they served food. The barracks we had was, was a barracks was just the just the book, monks, just a place to live. Mm -hmm. The food was in another building. You had your weapons in here, your rifles that you trained with, and. Uh, so we went there until uh, August. What kind of rifle do you train with? Uh, the old Springfield. The Springfield old 03? Oh, uh, 03, I believe it was a number mm -hmm. of it. That's right, I believe it was. Of course, then, then I got August. I got the in August. Okay. And the first group of recruits we had were K. Johns from Louisiana. And that was a kind of an unusual, you know, you just didn't realize, you know, you just, you know, here we had 250 Cajuns. You know who I'm talking about. Yeah. Two or three of them could speak English out of the 250 who went to high school. Well, of course, they were made sergeants next day, of course. And they did their interpreting. You get out of the grounds. And uh, to give an order, and he'd repeat it in French, okay, John, you know. And as I was from college, the captain said, Beck, you'll, uh, we'll have a school at night. Try to bring these people a little up to date. You have a school every night. So we assembled in this room. And of course, the first thing you got interested in is what they knew. Had this Followed well, already not the first sergeant who could speak who went to high school. You'd ask him, him a question, you'd ask them. And uh, they didn't know what the United States was. They were they, about the only thing they knew was the parish in Louisiana they lived in. Louisiana, fairly good idea about Louisiana. Uh, what are we in the war? You only got two answers. The sheriff said to come, and once in a while, some of them said, to kill the Kaiser. Uh, well, that, you know, that's quite a thing. Well, then after we kind of got them clipped over for about three months, and out in their impression was going over there, these guys who could speak French, they needed to be military police, because they could speak native languages of the people. So they took our people all out. So we started another bunch. <laughs> so they took all these cases in Europe. Uh, early in the bunch, well, the first benches, I made a military police out of it. Because while I'm sure their cage on had slipped a little from French in 200 years, I guess it was, since they came from Arcadia. But it was close enough. They could, they could, they could get along very well. So what did you do with the second group? Where'd they come from? Well, they, the second one we, we, was really guys from Tennessee. 
and they were, they were physically they were fire fine people. But when we trained them a while, they took them. Then we went to Fort Dix, New Jersey, and then we got the people out of New York City, you know, the people that, Italians and people, uh, a lot of them couldn't, couldn't speak very much, but kind of a broken kind of English. And that's the ones we went over with. And now getting in the summer of, of 18, we didn't get over till the summer of 18. Mm -hmm. War was over in November the fall. We didn't get to see much action over there. My, my out. Didn't. Well, tell me about the trip over on the boat. Well, we went over, we were, I, we were in a convoy. Uh, the, uh, oh, it was a medium-sized one I was on, a kind of medium-sized ship, but there was a convoy of about uh, six or eight vessels, and then they had these sub-chasers, little boats a little faster, circling all the time, you know, on the outside, all the time. Of course, I, I don't think it did us a lot of good. We could done, but, but it was a, a precaution. But they would assign us, all right, you'd have two hour duty to be alert for anything unusual in the way over there. Then they'd change. Have a, they had, oh, on this ship they had 10 posts, let's say, different places. There'd be a guy there. You, of course, you had a weapon and you're supposed to stay awake and see anything, see anything there. Of course, uh, these, uh, we call them sub-chasers, I guess they were. They were they were a small boat, but pretty fast. They were really faster than us. And you, they'd skirt around about a mile away. Three or four of them around this convoy. Convoy of about, in the convoy we had of about six of these. What, what was the name of the ship you were on? Corona, C O R O L A, Corona. And we landed in England. And we spent a few days there before we crossed, uh, crossed into Cherbourg. And then I went to a school up near the front, uh, advanced school. But it wasn't in the fighting, it was, it was trench warfare, all the stuff that they gave us you know, and grenades and what was going on over there. And when I went back to my outfit by Bordeaux and was in Bordeaux when the armistice was signed. Mm -hmm. Did you ever get, how many battles were you involved? I did actually, my, I never was actually on a battle myself. Okay. Describe, to, describe what the trenches were like, what they looked like. Well, they were, they were just, you know, they're about like the pictures, you know, they they dig these trenches. About Shoulder deep most of the time, and then the, you had you had this other dirt in front of you, you know, along over there, and they were wide enough, about as wide as that thing right there. About two. I mean, could pass each other. Yeah, you three know. feet wide. Within two to a half, three feet wide. Yeah. You could you could you could have a pack, and you will be the guy you could pass him. Mm-hmm. Were they were the walls lined with anything? No, they were just dirt, and most of them. The, they just stood up there, you know, just dry enough. Of course, you, you, you run into things when it rained, you know, they were, they were rained, and there's some kind of water in there. You'd, maybe there was a slope from down here at the end, you know, of a place, have something to dip the water out or find a place to drain it. Or yeah. something. That's sanitation. Oh, of course, you had to. You ever, ever, you ever have an army in latrine? Sit it. Of course, they had those. You sat up there. You, you sat up the latrine somewhere. Were they in the trenches or out of no, the trenches? No, they used, well, it's another place, but off, not right here. Not right where the fellows, most of these in the trenches, you were, they were, they were being on duty all the time, see. Uh, depends on the situation, whether it was very thick or not, you know, I'm sure. When it was there and you, uh, uh, what's the while they'd, you'd get up here and, Decide that to uh, do a little sharp shooting, you know, over there on something's on the other side. But it was not too, uh, the other trenches weren't too far away. Mm -hmm. Then, well, they were a bit of a stalemate, you know, it was a, kind of a 
stalemate kind of a thing, you know, we were there. Of course, every once in a while there'd be a, you know, somebody would be at the idea, well, we, what we need to do is let's, let's move up here 20 miles. And bombardment, you know, you get out and run, get into these new holes. If you got enough of them, run enough, kept up prisoners, you might make a new, have a new location, you know. Most of them, there were places so I was told, I, where I was, that the trenches had been within the same lot for two or three years. They decided, decided that there was worth the men to take to move it. You know, any time you're going to move it, you, you, you're going to, of course, they give it a bombardment. They'd put a lot of shells in there and, and get them running, get them hidden the hole. Then a bunch of people jump up and run over there, you know, and uh, whatever you can do. Is that what they call trench warfare? Trench warfare. That was, trench. That was of course, I'm, I don't, I, I don't guess. You don't see in any of the things now any trench warfare in pictures. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I don't think it was in the Second World War because vehicles moved to that. When we were there, there. Communication was pretty slow. Uh, few trucks they were not very good. Tanks weren't very efficient, you know. Uh, you were an infantry officer, weren't you? I was an infantry. Yeah. I didn't. I never. I never rode a tank. Always mine was always a foot. All I was a foot. Mm -hmm. What did you do at Armistice Day? Well, of course, we were, we, were, we were getting loaded to go to the front. And we, of course, begin to hear that it's probably what will happen. And it, it's, of course, I don't know whether you've read, but in this country, there was a false alarm two days ahead. Somebody said the armistice on the 9th. But it wasn't, you know, people celebrated. So when it come up on the 11th, why, there's kind of us there. Well, over there, there was no, nothing, no false alarm. And the, on, on the 11th, that, we, we, we got word and uh, commanding officer and, and the assembled officers and, and, uh, and uh, he, had, he received, uh, of course, uh, the official communication from the general as of 11 o'clock a.m. this morning, shooting would cease. Oh, shooting would cease. 11 well, that was quite something. So we all, of course, went to town. Bordeaux. I don't know whether anybody's ever told you about that or not. I doubt if there was. Where's my? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. We talk about Armistice Day. Oh yeah. What you did? What you did? Oh, on that day. That's a, that's a, I, I, I doubt if there was ever one day in history. When uh, there was so much emotion expended in one day as the armistice of the First World War. Really, I, uh, you, 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 uh, our, our other wars, we ended up a little at a time. Or this and that, and nothing and other. Well, listen, particularly in France and England, and for even the United States, it's all new stuff. War, war is bad. And here's over. We went to Bordeaux, and the town people turned out. Thousands, hundred thousand. And from uh, <coughs> oh, three or four o'clock in the afternoon until midnight. People marched and sang and hugged each other and drank a little and sang some more and marched some more and, and met people and hugged them and, and shouted and uh, not just a few of them. I mean thousands. I mean thousands. I've talked to people who were in, in, in Paris who was a little bit down, maybe more. Uh, 
Armistice Day of 1918. I mean, world, it was pretty well, pretty well worldwide. A lot of people. It is the first time big war had ever happened. And a lot of people killed. And it was over. It's over. It's over. And uh, you, 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 uh, you're getting a little blood blase now. We bring the boys home from Lebanon. Uh, oh, if they march down the street, you might look over your shoulder, you know, or whatever. But we're Armistice Day of 1918. Was something. It was something. I was in Bordeaux. So the celebration lasted about midnight. Oh yeah, most of them. Oh, midnight you were pretty around going home. I didn't. I think we went home. Of course. Uh, oh, few of them got would keep drinking until somebody had to haul them out somewhere, but. Most of them decided that they'd rather shout and sing and dance and just drink a little and, and for half an hour than drink a little more, you know, rather than get too drunk. They, they was, uh, what happened in Paris? On, on this Paris is Paris. more than the same. They told me, and I've been told, that, that uh, there were some big entertainers. French could get out of there and sing, you know. We didn't have amplification in those days. They didn't, you sang what you could hear. You didn't, you didn't have any live speakers. Mm -hmm. And they could sing a patriotic song, you know. And that would, that would set them off again, you know. And they'd sing to them, and then people would march and sing and dance and shout and up and down the streets and wherever they went, you know. And uh, maybe somebody, then, uh, half an hour, somebody would mount on this platform. Somebody went and they'd change his gun to it. They'd sing another Marseillaise, you know, French song. Star Spangled Banner or something. Thousands. Mm -hmm. thousands and, and big thousands. Uh, I don't know if I saw any people who estimated the size of crowds. But in Mordeaux, there was an area. Where I, live, where I was, kind of an inside park, which is about two blocks wide and about four blocks long, pretty well in the middle of town. It was kind of a park area, you know, one of those big buildings. No buildings. Then the streets off of there. And uh, of course, that was. Good place for a lot of people to assemble. Mm -hmm. Come back, go through there. They go up so many side streets, you know, and maybe a street go up this way. Go up a half a mile, you know, have some uh, start a song, you know, and watch. Up that street a half a mile. People are along there and long there as thick as they can be. I I, uh, I don't know if I made you recognize that it was an unusual day. Mm -hmm. Armistice of eighteen was an unusual day as far as human emotion is concerned. Well, and after the war, some of them heard of them. I, I, I decided to go to, uh, they, they, they took, of course, they didn't have fast transportation. What do you do with these two million Americans over here now? War's over. You want to keep them out of trouble. You know, you just have nothing to do. So they organized the American University, and there people go to uh, Cambridge and uh, and uh, Oxford in England and Paris University, the Sorbonne <coughs> in Paris, and and uh, there, oh, let them go to school. I signed up, and I went to Sorbonne University, in Paris. Can you speak French? All they ask is, well, all you had to do is put a yes. <laughs> Nobody tested me. Of course, we took, we had a, we had a woman very, it was a very sweet experience, a woman who couldn't talk English, to teach us French. We go to her class, uh, Alliance Francaise, and then we'd go to these lectures, and we'd hear a lecture in, in French, two or three lectures, 
then the, the third one that week would be a man who talked English, who would tell us what the man told us before. <laughs> and if we, if we heard a little of him ask questions, we could ask him questions. You know, mm -hmm. quite an experience. How much I've, got, I've got certificates. They're great big things. How much French did you learn? Oh, I, I, I make pretty good French. I can make pretty good. Oh, yeah. You learned enough for conversation French. You know, you, you can go into a cafe. I, go, I could go into, I could go into a, a community. I, I got a job as a building officer where people couldn't talk English. And I could talk enough French to, to, to get along. To find and where did you go to school? In, in France? Yeah. Sarbonne. The Sarbonne. You've heard of the Sarbonne? Sarbonne? Yeah. That's in Paris, France. What did you think of Paris? I took it all. Well, and English, and French. Mm -hmm. French and law. Well, you know. Did you go to Notre Dame Cathedral? Oh, yeah, I was in many times. I can let me get out. You know, just, just your own experience. You know, your own experience, this is just an individual thing. Of course, during NASA bombardment, they had uh, all the Louvre museums and things like that, all these famous paintings that they think was a million dollars piece, you know. They all moved them out loud. They uh, hid them in caves somewhere, you know. Well, the armistice are over where they called us bringing them back. Well, this Louvre Museum was a, was a big thing. So on Sundays, you know, uh, I'd go, I'd go uh, look at these. And the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, they had an organized American, somebody who would, you'd, you'd go to a place and sign up and you'd have a guide to take you, you know. Well, I, that's a guy, that's fine. I'll be well, just do it on my own. Just do this on my own. So, uh, uh, oh, I've been several times, and here were some of these famous things. One Sunday I was up there, and, and they had opened up some more in another area, and, and these rooms where these uh, paintings were, were about, oh, about as big as this room from these lamps. On down that way, you know. About 20 by 30 feet? About 20 by 30 feet in that general neighborhood. And back over there, beyond the little rope, here would be three or four paintings. You know, I'm going to pull on something. And the rope over here, you could get within six feet. On here, and then one person here to kind of watch you, you know. You come in, and this guy to tell people, oh, these are, this. if you get close enough, you can read who's. What's on that? Well, I've been in, uh, I've been looking at these, and a lot of them are portraits, and uh, kind of gotten a little slow. And I come into a room here, and there was three paintings over here, and uh, I walked in, and I didn't even go over close enough to read the number, the name. I said, uh, "Well, those are all nice, aren't they? That's that's very good. I believe I'll go on." But just as I walked out. One of these guides would troop about 12 or 15 GIs. He, he come in here with this much. And as he walked into this room, he says, now boys, this is the famous Mona Lisa. I, I, I looked at it and it was about to leave. So I let them talk. Then I went back and took another look. <laughs> now this is the famous Mona Lisa. It's the most famous one in the world, Paul Dayton. Mm -hmm. Same as the hunt. <laughs> and you say you're gonna miss it. I'm yeah. gonna miss it. <laughs> ah, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. So how long do you stay in France? Well, I until July. Come home and discharge July. Mm -hmm. Stayed for my. We went up there in about. Uh, well, the armistice in, in November. They got these organized in about a month, six weeks. I think I went up there about February. Stayed until the end of June. I, I got home by the, I believe, the seventh day of July. Yeah. Of 1990. Was there a big bushy parade when you got home? Well, no, no. Uh, of 
course, I don't know where they had some, I guess, in some of the big cities. Of course, in the they were just, they were scattered, you know. Of course, they did that when the big bunches come home. The rest of us were just coming home now, getting discharged and coming home as best we could. Mm -hmm. so, so you came back and went back to A&M? Then I went back and finished after 1920. And got your degree in animal husbandry? Animal husbandry. Tell me about your commencement exercises. Your commencement exercises. Ooh, Judge Robert L. Williams, who was once governor of Oklahoma, who became a uh, federal judge. To you, or the name familiar to you, Robert L. Williams? Mm -hmm. They had him for the commencement speaker. Uh, my mother came down. Uh, my father was dead. Uh, he died in 19. Or the first, he, I got home before he died, but he died summer 1919. Uh, what impressed you about Judge Williams? What do you remember about him? Oh, what did they talk about? As I would, you know, nowadays we, we kind of think of people in public life as conservative or liberal. You know, kind of that sort of thing. Uh, old time values. Uh, others comes to oh, it's a new day, it's a new program. What's going on? We're, we're going we're going somewhere from here. Well, Williams was of the conservative, old uh, older values, pretty much. I can't remember that he had any points that I could recall at this time. Other than you just sort of remembered him as a uh, as a judge of uh, well, he, he, good intelligence and that sort of thing, perhaps, but of the uh, conservative type, older value things. Mm -hmm. He didn't talk about a new day, you know. It's all over new here. The world's going to be new. You can talk about that. You can talk about the other. Oh, that's about as far as I That's about as long as I can remember. Mm -hmm. After you got your degree, what'd you do? Well, uh, oh, I, I, I had a buddy. He went to New York. I decided to. We, we didn't know what to do. So I went to. We both went to New York. And I got a job and went to night school at Columbia University for one year. And I didn't, didn't do so hot. So I come back and to Oklahoma. He stayed married there. I came back and uh, farmed a little and uh, uh, the thing uh, went downhill a little. So the first job that I got was a white teacher. Well, I, I, I taught in the winter at Blackwell as a substitute and got a WAG job for five years in Punk City with Joe Hamilton. Who's Joe Hamilton? Oh, he's, he, was, he was a good man. He was superintendent. He, uh, you see, Lou Wentz lived in the, uh, you heard of Lou Wentz. Had money, had a good public spirit and sort of thing. Uh, I don't know enough about him to know where he got the idea. But the idea of crippled children organization come along. And uh, Lou was hunting for a place to put some money. He had it. He was married. And he decided that's the thing. And uh, so it needed a kind of a director that was the right kind of you know, start from the bottom. We started with a good man. He knew Joe Hamilton. Mm -hmm. Joe Hamilton was still in the schools that I'd worked for in Punk City. So Lou Wentz hired him. But they organized the Crippled Children's Society. Well, now it's 
it's uh, it's run by their own membership. I mean, they they, they get the money. Mm -hmm. The first five years, I don't know this for the fact. I don't know the books. I'm talking about what appeared to me from the outside that uh, Lou Wentz financed the first five years of it. <laughs> now, whether if somebody will look up the record of yeah. uh, it's a little different that way, don't know who is responsible. Yeah, right. I'm just telling you that that's sure. kind of the general. But they, but they picked a good man. Joe Hamilton was a, and he, until he retired then, he was the secretary, the first secretary, and set up the Crippled Children's Society of Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. and, uh, what kind of man was Lou Wentz? Well, I'll tell you another one, Lou Wentz. Of course, he was a Republican, conservative, politically. But one time when I was there, I went to a meeting where he was. And he made the speech. And among other things, of course, and that county had a poor farm in it. Have you ever heard of the poor farms? Mm -hmm. That county had one. I was never actually inside, but I drove by it, where people lived, you know, where they'd, when you get old and didn't have anything else, couldn't make a living. Kids didn't take you. Well, I didn't get, they, they, they'd take you out to the poor farm. Of course, they had a few chickens and hogs, and man and his wife look after them. They kind of kept them together. And they, one day or another, survived as long as they could. Yeah. Not much of a deal. Mm -hmm. Not much of a deal. Well, that's all there was. The people who owe. And I heard Lou Wentz, a conservative Republican as there ever was one. He said, we're not doing this thing now. He read in the paper somewhere where they, in New Zealand, out of their tax money, they put up money to give a monthly income to old people, and they stayed at home. He says, that's the way we ought to do this. Now, that's the first I ever heard of old Abe Fincher in my life. I ever heard of it anywhere. Well, some new ends, as I say, as a conservative Republican, they didn't want to find anywhere. But I, I, I expect he had, he had been by this full farm, you know. I didn't have to do it. And he, he must have read somewhere in some magazine in the country of New Zealand. They've come up with the idea of, of giving an old age pension. And he says, that's what we ought to do. It's the first time I ever heard of it. Well, he was that kind of a guy. He, uh, oh, the public's wanting to run for governor. He was pretty popular. Uh, if a Republican could have been elected governor back there, he might have. But here's what happened to the court they said. I don't know. I still I don't know the truth. But when he was in boy, Pennsylvania, he got in trouble. And for a while he sent to a reform school for a year or two. And then he decided he, that wasn't for him, you know, he would make it. And he did. Well, that he said, well, that anytime you get in politics, they drag that stuff out. And he says, I believe I should leave that behind me. So he never ran for office. Although he was on the State Highway Commission, two or three different governors behind him, State Highway Commission. And, uh, and of course, he, Marlin lived in the same town, but they were, I guess, jealous or competitors or whatever. They didn't like each other. They, didn't, they never, they never, two never appeared on the same program while I was there. I was there five years. Those two never were there on the same one. Like I said, that's why they then, of course, now then, in more recent years, I, uh, of course, got to, uh, after the flag stuff, I, I was on a ranch. I decided to do a little ranching, but I went and ranching the wrong time with a fellow named Loman, Osage County, and Depression come along, and uh, he had the money, and I was doing the work. We couldn't do anything about it, so I got a job with extension then, and that was.
to what year did you order Mangum? I'm a Thirty-four? Right in the drought, depression. Stayed 12 years through the war to 46. Um, the family, but I, can't, I don't remember particularly. And then after I worked in the, there, I got a job with the associate livestock specialist. And then when Bennett, Dr. Bennett, went to Ethiopia, or met with Haile Selassie, and they set up the deal over there. I went to Ethiopia for four years. Oh, you did? What did you do in Ethiopia? Well, I was livestock again over there, the whole idea. An extension. The whole job, the, of course, we, we set up, to, first of all, a high school, and then they went out on the bare land and built and established an agricultural college, an experiment station. And then I helped to, we started an extension service. We, we took just boys, of, or high school boys, made them county agents, so-called, you know, representatives of the college out in the community, try and make contact with people. Because that's what worked in this county. That's what, that's what worked, you know. Here, you, you've got a contact right out there, a county agent right out on the ground. And he's got all the latest information in regard to improved agriculture activities, and keep him informed. That's the easiest way to get the information out. And of course, we were sitting at it. I worked over there. Okay. I was there from 53 to 57. And I came home in 57, came here. And uh, I only had five more years until they retired me at 65, uh, which was uh, 57, which was 62, then I retired from extension. Then this so-called poverty program come along of uh, Lyndon Johnson's you know, community action thing. Mm -hmm. And I became kind of director of that for from 66 to, uh, well, I just retired from that in uh, 80. Mm -hmm. So when did you move to Wilburton? 57. 1957. Do you know anything about the history of Wilburton and Latimer County? Oh, there's a book. Well, I wrote a book here for it. Uh, Who was Will Burton? He had to do with, uh, let's see, we had a Jess Bailey, who was a kind of historian here. I got some dope on Will Burton. No, he got some dope on Latimer, the man Latimer that named the county after. Mm -hmm. The town then was named, uh, I'm not sure that the man was named as fully Wilburton, like Wilbur or something. The Latimer, the man Latimer. Yeah, he was Latimer. He, he was a, he, uh, Railroad agent, something here or something like that, you know. But he got elected to the uh, state uh, legislature at the convention, or first one after the uh, statehood. Okay. When they were doing these things in counties. Mm -hmm. um, people think he wasn't too aggressive. That is, they let, let some of these other counties get the good parts around the edges, you know, Lafleur, Pittsburgh, whatever. But left a little area here, or not too much there. But he was there, so he got it named after him. Yeah. So I've been told. Speaking of statehood, do you remember statehood day? Nin yeah. 1907? <coughs> yeah, the original, very yeah. little. <coughs> I was 11 years old. I was in school, but out in the country, uh, there wasn't, now that I've, I've talked to people who <coughs> who lived in, like in town or, or bigger schools, and they had a bigger celebration. Mm -hmm. They had, you know, and I, I can't remember our little country school up there. 
one room school was probably, at that time, I'd say, uh, 12 or 15 kids, woman teacher, mm -hmm. and uh, not much, not much made of it. Mm -hmm. I haven't any particular recollection of. What about the Sequoia Convention? Are you familiar with it? Which one? <coughs> the Sequoia Convention in 1906. Oh, the original Indian Convention. Yeah, that's when they tried to make Indian, Indian. territory the state of Sequoia. I couldn't give you much information about that. I wouldn't know much about it. I wasn't here. I was I was over on the other side there. Yeah. I was not here on the Indian side. Mm -hmm. uh, in World War One. Ever talk to any of the soldiers that had been gassed? Yeah. What they what they say about that? Well, there were some gassed people. Yeah, that had their lungs burnt. Yeah, there were there were people there. there was, they used chlorine, you know. Of course, the one thing about it, it was it was fairly visible. I was sold. Yeah. Now I never saw it ever myself, but where it was uh, actually, but the fellows who saw it. I it, 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 it put it low, but, and it showed green. You could see it. You could see it. That's cool. So that if you had a mask, you really got dizzy if you weren't, if you weren't careful, and, and did something about it, and maybe, maybe you got away from it, got on the higher ground. And, uh, but I talked to some people who, who, who uh, breathed it and, and had problems, mm -hmm. health problems afterwards. Yeah. World War II, what'd you do? Well, I was a county agent in, uh, in uh, Latimer, in uh, Greer County, mm -hmm. at Mangum. Were there many uh, organized activities in Mangum to support the war effort? Oh, yeah, we had, we, we, we oh, of course, the, the, uh, the bond drives, and the, mostly it was bond drives, and uh, gardening, you know, people, Emphasis on the gardening, you know. Uh, I remember as county agent, they decided we ought to. Uh, somebody said we, if we got some land where people grow some flax, and I got some flax seed, and a few please planted, but the flax didn't turn, didn't do so good. Uh, uh, we had. Uh, The, the the garden the home home garden program, mm -hmm. bond drives, uh, particularly, were the biggest uh, local activities that you got involved in. We we, we promoted uh, everybody everybody had a garden everybody had a garden, you know, need food so you want to buy so much. Uh, we had. Uh, of course, you had rationing and had problem tires and gasoline, and, and uh, you had to, had to do that sort of thing. <clears throat> Reasonably well complied with. Some cheating, I'm sure. You yeah, have what's of people, but but uh, there was the sentiment was good enough that uh, people who would try to cheat on it didn't meet with approval much. You know, uh, they couldn't do much about it, but, mm -hmm. but the rather general thing was that let's uh, tell the truth when you went to, to go to get your stamps and get your stuff. Mm -hmm. Close to the truth. Yeah. Stretch out only a little bit. Uh, not, not, not really to skin them, you know. Reasonably good. Pretty good feeling, I'd say, where I was in the war of war. Whenever you found out that war had been declared in 1917, would the many students at A&M join up? Well, I didn't know. My, of course, my class, when they come back and graduated, 
why I was in the 18 class, graduating the 20 class. The 20 was about 80 there in one class to graduate. And then they had, uh, I expect we had uh, in the freshman and sophomore and junior years, the total enrollment would be in the neighborhood of 100 to a class. Mm -hmm. Then they organized a, uh, a uh, training program in addition to the, 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 the uh, this. I had a friend who, who joined, they called it the, but they weren't, they weren't in the service. They took some training, but if you wanted to go to Army, you did, but if you didn't, well, you, I mean, you weren't signed up. Yeah. You weren't already enrolled uh, on, the, on the campus. I wasn't there. Of course, during the war, I wasn't there. I was, I, I left in, the, in uh, May of, 17, come back in September of 19. Sure. So it wasn't around there too much about it. Mm -hmm. How many um, students from A&M were killed in the war? I don't know. I suppose they must have a list up there somewhere. I don't know. I don't think I've ever seen the figure. Yeah. Okay. I don't believe I've ever seen that figure. Mm -hmm. Well, how big was Stillwater when you first went there? What did the town look like? Oh, it was a pretty small town. It was about, a, about like this town, four or five thousand people. Mm -hmm. You, uh, the, uh, the campus, of course, where Washington Street is there now, that was a highway, a road, and all the rest of that was pasture, you know, all along the valley. And uh, there wasn't anything north of the, the, the Boomer Lake out there, and uh, not much east. We, I'd say, well, I'd say it was a town of. 5,000 when I was there. What were the major businesses there besides the school in Stillwater? What, what? The major businesses in Stillwater? Oh, they've, they've got some factoring, uh, manufacturing out there now. I'm not sure just what they are. They uh, they put in two or three small plants. Well, when you first went there. There wasn't was anything. Nothing? I don't think there was anything there. Yeah. don't know of anything except the college. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the county seat to them. Mm -hmm. Government and college. When's the first time you went to Enid? Uh, that's a good question. I remember going over there to uh, a thing one time as a boy, I rode the train from Hunter down there, and came home the same day. Later, the train came back. Mm -hmm. uh, That was about the time, that was a little before I graduated in eighth grade, I think. It was about the sixth or seventh grade. Um, how many wagons did you have on your farm? Many how what? many wagons did you have we on your farm? We had two. Uh, we, had, we usually had two wagons. Well, a pretty good one. And then uh, when one, one was worn out, you know, that you used for junk, and, Good when you old wheat town. Yeah. Just loose wheat, you know. We'd, we'd shovel wheat. What kind of wagons were they? Well, Studebaker. And I think I was a Studebaker with sideboards. You had one team. And then hold 50 bushel of wheat, you know. Mm -hmm. And I scooped wheat as a boy. Of course, that was about the time uh, I was. Uh, home after my first year or two in college, summer, when I was getting about 16, 17. Yeah. I remember it was a good way summertime. How much would a new wagon cost at that time? Well, I 
I remember trying to remember, I'd say in the general neighborhood of $100. Whenever you bought the wagon, what came with it? The, the wagon, the bed, the sideboards, and one spring seat. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've seen these seats, you know, spring on each end for two people to ride. That's tongue and devil race. Did the uh, bowls and the wagon sheet come with it? No, no. No, you, you had to buy those separate. How much they cost? Well, I don't know. We, after I got up there, we never used one. Mm -hmm. Now, we had had one before. My mother rode one to Missouri, and they got those bowls, and, but, but uh, oh, you know, after a few years, you lay it aside if you don't use it again. Something happens, yeah, you know. Right. You know, I don't remember ever seeing. What kind of maintenance do you have? Did you perform in the wagons? What kind of maintenance? Grease the wagon wheels with the axle grease. How'd you do that? Oh, you just, they had a big, big nut there, and the, 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 the pin that held a, the, the double tree end also had a end that opened this nut. So you take it there, and the, you, you'd do it when the wagon's empty, and the fellow would pick it up, you know, and move it out of ways, and some fellow hold it here. You wouldn't let it get cloth, off, you'd move it so that off the axle, mm -hmm. grease the air good, put it back on, put the thing back on. Okay. Grease it about. Oh, you'd grease the wagon twice every summer. Is it about the only maintenance you really had to do? That's the only thing you had to do the wagon. Yes. Okay. Grease the wagon, wagon, wagon grease. Axle. They call it axle grease. Mm -hmm. It's named axle grease for the wagon axles. Um, what kind of plow do you have? Well, we had two. We had both a moldboard plow and a disc plow. Dry weather, you'd have discs. We had three discs. You know what a disc looks like. Mm -hmm. Take about uh, six horses to pull it. The moldboard, we had, I, I, I was a boy. <coughs> I worked with a single moldboard with three horses. <coughs> gentle horses. They'd give me the gentle horses and this moldboard plow. One moldboard. And uh, that's when I was 10 years old, let's say. There would be another, he'd be adult, an older boy, my dad, in the field also, usually. Mm -hmm. But I'd, I'd, drive a, I'd, I'd drive a wagon. I'd drive a, uh, three horses with a moldboard plow. How, much, how many acres did you plow in one day? You, you got three acres with those. You had a good day to get three acres with one moldboard plow, with three horses. You had a kind of a general deal. You got a bigger outfit and more horses. If you could, if you could manage close to an acre a day per horse, you were doing a good. It's kind of a guideline to go by. Uh, three horses there. Well, if you got up early and worked all day, and it didn't wear out too on you, you could plow three acres. That's pretty good. Pretty good. Yeah. Of course, that's long rows, you know. You, you, you'd make rounds, you know. How long were the rows? Oh, we were half a mile out of the time, you know. Mm -hmm. hmm. We grew a little corn. We grew quite a lot of wheat. I remember the first binder. What does the binder do? Well, it, it bound them into a bundle, you know. The wheat? The wheat. You cut it and then had a, it had a bundle over here. And it was, they had a they had a knot knotter and bind and twine, you know, mm -hmm. and they'd tie this bundle there and and they'd catch it here, tie a knot there, you know, kick it out. You had a carrier and, and you'd have them you know, dump them in a row so that it'd be easy to shock up with. And I worked in the summer on a thrashing crew, you know, we had bundle haulers haul these bundles into a thrashing machine. Was a thrashing machine run by steam? Yeah, all steam. Oh, How remember. does that thrashing machine work? Huh? How does it work, the thrashing all machine? All right, here, of course, the thrashing machine, here was a the separator, and here was a belt here, going in here. And first of all, there they were some knives that had cut these binder twines. So they scatter, see, in these binder twines. So the first, 
The first thing was a was a little thing up here, had knives like that, about four of them, about three or four inches apart. Mm -hmm. And then of course it, you run it, and uh, and uh, this was, it was coming this way, you know, knife come here, and it's cut those binder lines. So this wheat then would scatter. And a cylinder, then the flashing machine was a cylinder. It was about uh, 12 inches in diameter, uh, 30 inches long, and it had, it had teeth. Oh, let's say compared to a finger, bolted in there, you know, but it's a little wider this way. And then, now then, and they were rows of them. And then underneath here, here was a, a bunch of them. It was stationary. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, they're, they're geared so that this was run between there. And as that run through there, why it shelled us and it hit this head of wheat, you know. I shelled it so that the, the grain and the chaff would be separate. You know, the next one there and there. And, and of course they were feeding all the time in through, as it went through there. And uh, uh, they had sieves, you know, to shake it mm -hmm. when the chaff would go to the top. We just go down here, you know, shaft, and uh, then a blower to blow the straw out, the straw piles. We had straw piles all over the place, you know, and blew the straw out, and then they had shake out this there, and here was a down here, and uh, if it was two, then they had a place where it would reverse and go through again. Then they'd have a place up here, and, and fill a, a dump a half a bushel at a time, so they count the bushels. Into the wagon. You have your wagons, lumber wagons, we call them lumber wagons, mm -hmm. made out of wood, mm. filled up with wheat. Yeah, as a boy, that was, we, we grew wheat on our farm, cut it with a binder, hauled it to the rash machine, this steam engine and the belt, you'd be about as far, the steam engine would about a, your belt, be about as far as this full room here from there. I bet. See? You know, 40, 50 feet? 40 feet. Right. Yeah. Which would be an 80 foot belt. Yeah. Up there in back. You know. mm -hmm. About that. Well, I think we have a good interview. <coughs> well. Tell us more about this part of the state, southeast Oklahoma. Well, because we're down here in Indian, we're Choctaw. Yeah. <coughs> And uh, of course, here's the place where the original grapes of wrath, you know, started from here. This is like this. Here, when they, they moved in here, people, early from the Indians' days, and they'd get these 40 and 80 acres, and they'd have. Uh, Ten acres of cotton, ten acres of corn, uh, maybe a little less stuff, faster, a few cows and chickens. This town, I think they said, had three gins. Mm -hmm. Our family then was that they could plant this cotton, they could chop it, pick it. If you made a Maybe maybe ten bales of cotton in a year. Was a good crop. Yeah. Back in those days, the bale was be. Oh, I uh, you got a bale and picked bale, maybe uh, hundred dollars. So the total cash for the year, thousand dollars. Pretty big deal. And uh, they pay off the debts, you know, buy the groceries a bit. Of they eat a little out of the other. A little corn. Okay, well, when the Depression come, in these thirties, some dry weather, and cotton, these bales were not worth a hundred dollars anymore. 
you these bales were worth uh, twenty-five dollars, and the corn was worth twenty-five cents a bushel. Had it to sell. Well, that's when they loaded up and went to California, and this country is full of people who, well, at that time, and of course, then the World War came along, and a lot of the young people went to war. They come home, and there wasn't anything here, so they went to California, Detroit, or somewhere, and got a job with the oil companies. Mm -hmm. The Indian did. Nowadays, right now. There are a lot of these people coming back. They worked 30 years. Well, maybe they owned a little 40 acres or five did. Well, they'll come back to it, you know, build a house and retire. We have a pretty high percentage of people who've made a living and now retired or are back here living here mm -hmm. to, uh, what well, they grew up here. Uh, they know when you go to go, go ground at a cafe, somebody will come in. Somebody say, well, say, who's that that's come in? Oh, well, that is Mr. X, Y, Z or something. Uh, well, maybe they come to a funeral. Yeah, I remember him. I remember his sister. Why, well, I went to school with his sister 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. You know, there's an awful lot of remembering people that they knew back there, you know. Well, they're coming back here now. Quite a lot of it. It's more than new, more than most places. Hmm. It's pretty much uh, a return to uh, men who grew up here as young men, but nothing here. So they go to Detroit, where there was work, mm -hmm. or Michigan, or California. But they're coming back here now. Now they retire. A lot of them come back. Not a lot, but a few people who get their roots somewhere else, you know. Mm -hmm. Kids marry. I have, uh, for example, I've known a few families where, okay, they go to California. I had to raise a family in California mm -hmm. and uh, have a couple of kids. They marry. They marry people out there that's got jobs out there. And maybe the guys they marry didn't come from here. They came from, they came from Michigan. Yeah. Okay, these old people have come back here. And after a while, you know, they moved back to California where the kids are. Mm-hmm. Where'd you meet your wife? In the little town of Tonkawa. Tonkaball. Tonkaball. Oh, this uh, did a little ranch work out there. And my aunt, I had an aunt who lived there. My aunt met this girl, liked her. And uh, she got us acquainted in 1928. Quite a while ago. We married in 31. Mm -hmm. Who's this? Uh, that's my father and mother. Their marriage, that's their marriage date. Mm -hmm. That's my father, that's my mother. They were married and, uh, of course, I didn't see That's the woman who enlarged it for me, of course. Yeah. But that's my father. And he's the one that made the run of 93. He's the one that made the run of 93. You have two. Do you have next <laughs> one of these pictures? Oh, sure, yeah, I can make another. What do you want to use it? For the archives. Okay, I wouldn't mind. Yeah. His name was Stephen Arthur. Her, uh, her name was Nora Ann Lawson. Her, her people was, well, I've got a picture somewhere else, but I mean, yeah, that may have been there, but... Uh, and they married in uh, 88. 
December 88. No, wait a minute. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. No, wait a minute. The, the oldest brother was born in 89, and so they were born in, they were married in 87. Let's make it back to 87. Okay. Stephen Beck. Stephen Arthur Beck. And Nora Lawson. Nora Lawson, her name was Lawson. Okay. Well, this is a good interview. I've enjoyed this. Well, oh, you, you know, you go back over the uh, things that happened in the past, you know? Mm hmm. Educator. A county, a county superintendent of schools, who really was enthusiastic about trying to organize His name consolidated George, schools. George Rainey? Rainey. George, at Enid. Enid. In Enid. Okay. Of course, I'm sure he's, he, he's no law. He, of course, he was, he, was doing, he was an adult man. He was in his 40s or something, 50s when I was in high school, when I was in grade school. Mm -hmm. But I remember him coming out to the district, and uh, you know, uh, you, uh, you live in a country school, you don't run across very many people. Back in those days, in my life, between there and I went to war, the number of people who you run across who could even get up and talk about the only ones you ever knew was a preacher, you know, you, you didn't run across people. Well, George Rainey was kind of impressive. He was a smart man. I mean, you know, he, he mm -hmm. impressed you. Didn't he? What impressed you about him? Oh, he just, he was just intelligent. You know, he just, he had good language. He had a good, uh, had good there. And he called these meetings of people and talked to the advantage of education. What, what education was worth, you know? He, he'd give you, he'd give you a lift, you know. And he said, now the way to do it, he says, there isn't a way for you, to, your children to get to high school. He said, we can organize here, put four schools together. Of course, there's enough people in, in a township, to justify, at that time, a small high school, see. And the first one, that, it was one of the first ones organized, rural district of Oklahoma. I don't know this to be a fact. I wouldn't be surprised that George Rainey was, the, was one of the originators of, of, of promoters, of people talking. But they, we, we, we're going to have to give, the, give them a chance. These kind of boys, they can't go to Enid to high school. You know, 30 miles. we got to get schools here for them. How did he go about consolidating the schools? What did he do? How did he oh, he, just, he, he, he'd go to, he went to these four districts. And then... Uh, made his speeches, you know, got their patrons, see? And he told them all about it. They met this other school district. And he set up the district, this, 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 uh, this four, in a township. A township is six miles each way, you know. Mm -hmm. So there were four country schools in that township. And I suppose at that time, uh, the total number enrollment from first through eighth grade of the four districts would still be just on the conservative side of 100. 25 children to school, about 100. But he had, you know, now he, he was, you know, of course, those wouldn't last, they wouldn't last for long. I'm going back out there. And there isn't, there isn't a half a dozen people living in the whole district anymore, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, they moved into the wheat country. They moved off and one farm farmed four or five quarters, you know. But that wasn't true then. It's still horse and buggy. That's still the horse and buggy days. Of course, it, uh, cars were being invented, but not, nobody had had it yet. You know, 1911. And... Uh, Oh, 
if he were interested in early rural education. Now, I'm prejudiced, I guess, because I knew the man. That is, I didn't know him better than I was a, I was a eighth grade student. And he talked to the people. So where your kids go and they're and, and he could get up and make a nice speech. So I knew about it. He talked to education. Mm How -hmm. the opportunities? What the world's like? You know, you need to need to go to school. And it's impressive. Mm -hmm. When and his name was George Rainey. I'm, I'm, I'm sure about that. Yeah. And he was county kind of superintendent of school. Of course. How do you spell his last name? A R A I N E Y, if mm -hmm. I remember right. Yeah. Rainey. If you ever up to eat it sometime. Of course, and now uh, I'm I'm 87 years old. Let's see, 1911, 11, 11 off of 84. That was 73 years ago. How many people? now living, have a very good memory of 73 years ago. Not too many of them. Right. See, if you run across them, and of course if they lived in England, that was it. Well, what he was going to do was, he, he, he was really, he was really uh, kept up on the idea. Here was these countries, all over the country. Good to schools, eighth grade. Oh, they need to go to high school, so they can go to college, mm -hmm. so they can learn something. Let's organize, and that we were the first one he organized. We were the first district he organized, and it fizzled. We got, we got. They hired the wrong lawyer. They hired Gene Stipe instead of us. See, <laughs> who's Milt Garber? You still Garber's around there, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, no, Milt, uh, Milt Garber was okay, like these types, okay, if you, if you, if you, uh, if you like that kind of program. Mm -hmm. But he got it done, you know. If you got him on, on your side, well, you, you, won your, you won it. Whether it was good, bad, or indifferent. So, uh, so the other side were a little smarter. They got there first. When they go, saw this was going to get lawyers, they go and get hired Milt Garber. He had a son later on. Uh, of course, they named the town after him. Mm -hmm. And there's another Garber here. Uh, one of his sons, I think, just died of old age not very long ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When did you see your first car? Uh, about that time, a little before. I saw a car in the summer. See, this is 11. It probably was about two years before that. Could have been seven or eight. A car, I saw, I saw one car on the road. I dealt with it. I rode in a car, a Model F Buick. Of course, my dad had a little less land and the, the people who were selling there were you know, got a hold of those names, and so he came out to our house to sell my dad a Buick, Model F Buick. So I can remember a few things. The Model F Buick cranked on the side, had a chain drive, and of course it was all direct, you know. You didn't have anything, you had the chain, your motor was set this way, crossways, and the chain went to this axle, like this, see. And uh, you cranked it out here in the side. Uh, he let us ride it, my brother and I. And he said, well, you boys can drive it. And I, he let us sit it. He was sitting right here. Sit and guide the thing. And he'd shift the gears. And of course, we'd jump his track for this. Horses, you know, it's two-lane track, you know. Maybe 100 yards. And just about. And I remember my brother did it and let me do it. And he drove home, but my dad didn't buy the car. But I can remember doing the conversation. I, give, I can remember one thing of his conversation. Tell you who was bragging to my dad about this car. This is the car that'll put the Ford people out of business. A 
I'm not letting you chain drive. So I, this is the car that will put the Ford people out of business. And that was about, uh, that was a little before this 1911. Because in 11, when this, 13 was when this sheriff came out there in an automobile. They were not too common, but he had an automobile. The sheriff had an automobile in 1913. Of course, those were automobiles and horses. You, you have a team, and you meet it one time. Well, if you, if you couldn't, if there was a field gate, you drove out in the field, because your horse was scared. If you couldn't, there was a fence on both sides, but you'd pull over to one side. And everybody would get out and hold their horses by there, there to let the car go by. We did that all the time. Can you believe that? <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, we, we, you'd see. And my, we had a horse, Don. Never got used to a car. He died of old age, but he was scared of a car. One of our horses, one of our horses. Boy, if, if you saw a horse once or twice a year, maybe. You in a road with Don. There better be a gap in the field. He'd tear up Jack. He wouldn't. There was something there that he wouldn't he wouldn't put up with. Having to get out and get you get over here and you put blankets on that way you wouldn't see it. Hold him here so they can get motion and get on by. So they can go down the road. That's the way the horses were. <laughs> so horses are educated now. Horses are that that was that horses said that. Okay. <laughs> Thank uh, you.